Good morning, LifePoint family. This is Rex and Jennifer Critton. We're glad you're here, virtually. <laughs> We're so excited to spend this Sunday morning with you. If you have any questions, please put them in the comments below and we'll answer as best we can. Bye. See you on the show.
Hello everyone, welcome to Life Point Church. I want to say a special hello to all of our brand new homeschool parents and homeschool students. I know that this time is tough. Trust me, I have a kindergartner, so I'm right there with you. But I want you to remember that in the toughest of times, you're not alone that we're here with you, we're praying for you. Uh, On that note, we were gonna pray for our Church of the Week this morning. I'm gonna ask you to join us in prayer. It's for Northwest Community Friends Church. So would you pray with me? God, we thank you for this morning. We thank you for the opportunity we have to meet, uh, to have church together. Even though it's at a distance virtually, we can still be together and have community. And we're thankful for that, God. We pray for Northwest Community Friends Church, God. We thank you for all the work that they're doing with Care Portal. And God, we pray a continual blessing on their ministry as they navigate these times especially to meet the needs of those that have been placed in foster care, those that have found homes and need furniture, and that they can continue to partner with the community to meet those needs, God. We thank you for all the work that you're doing at Northwest Community Friends Church. God, we lift up life point to you. We know that you're doing a work here in this church, that this is your church. And God, we pray for our community, our city, our state, our world with this crisis going on. I pray for peace and for calm, God. I pray for our governing officials and our president, that there would be wisdom given, God, and that people would be placed in their lives to give biblical and godly direction, God, and that decisions would be made that need to be made quickly. God, we pray for those that have been affected by this virus in a negative way, those that have experienced loss or just sickness themselves or lost jobs, lost wages, God. We pray for comfort. We pray for peace. We pray as a church we can rise up and help those that have needs, God. But right now we want to look to you uh, for all of our answers, look to you for our peace, and look to you for our joy, God. We know that you are in control. Control. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. I want to remind you that you can get lessons and activities for your children on Sunday morning by going to our website, azlifepoint.com. There's plenty of resources for you as parents. You can print activities and do all that with your children every Sunday morning. So please take advantage of that. Also, we are continuing our Deacons Fund. This is an opportunity that we can be the church and give to those that are in need. So if you are in need or if you know anybody that is in need during this time, if you've been affected by the COVID-19, if you've lost wages, if there's been things that have come up that, that you just, you need dry goods, you need financial help, whatever that need is, please visit us at prayer at azlifepoint.com and we would love to help in any way that we can. But please send those requests in. We would love to pray with you about those and we would love to help in any way that we can. Just a reminder, midweek is up. What? So I want to invite you to join us every Wednesday for midweek. Uh, It'll be up in the afternoon on Wednesdays. We'll send out an Instagram reminder uh, so you don't forget to watch that. If you missed last week's, it will be up until the new one takes its place. And you can get that on our LifePoint Facebook page or our Instagram bio. So LifePoint Facebook page or Instagram bio, you can check out midweek. Please join us. Tell your friends. We would love for you to be a part of that. There's going to be games. There is going to be some prizes and then a quick devotional and a prayer time. So please join us with that. I also want to remind you that you can continue to give. You can give through mail or you can give through the giving tab on our website. So click azlifepoint.com, click on that give tab tab and, and continue to give that way. Remember to take this time to check in by commenting right here on this live stream. You can interact with one another as we come together for church. So let's take this moment, prepare our hearts and hear what Pastor Andy he has to say. Well, welcome everybody to Life Point Church, to Church Online. I just want to say welcome. My name's Andy, and I'm uh, the lead pastor here at Life Point Church. So I just wanted to say thank you for joining us during this uh, weird time. Isn't it very weird? I think weird is just a great way to describe what it is that's going on right now. In fact, I personally think they should change the definition in the Webster's Dictionary of weird to an adjective used to describe the year 2020. I think that would be the best definition for weird right now. It's just so interesting to me. You know, 2020 was the year that everyone was marketing and teaching on this idea of clarity of 2020 vision. Now, in a lot of ways, 2020 has become the exact opposite of what people have been expecting it to be. And For some people, that can cause a lot of anxiety, a lot of fear. 
And that's why I decided to create this two-part series, Anxious for Nothing. God doesn't want us to live in fear. He doesn't want us to live in anxiety. In fact, he desires the exact opposite for us, and he actually promises it to us. Peace and hope are not just possible, but they are actually promised by God. So looking vertically to God is where we're going to find this peace and this hope. But God has also wired us to help. You know, I don't spend a lot of time normally on social media, uh, but during this weird season, that's changed quite a bit. And I'll be honest, I've actually really, really loved being on social media. Some of the posts that people have been creating right now, they're just so darn creative and just hilarious. So here are, I just want to share with you, here are a few of my favorites that I've seen. Uh, With three kids at home, we read the Where's Waldo books a lot. You know, those classic books where you're trying to find Waldo in a crowd. Well, if you haven't yet seen it, someone got creative and came up with the latest edition of Where's Waldo, which is the social distancing version uh, right here. (laughs) There you can see Waldo all by himself, keeping his good six feet from his friends. Uh, The next one I find pretty funny is, you know, the Summer Olympics are supposed to be here Uh, in 2020. They're coming up. So whether or not they're going to happen is still up in the air, but uh, someone got very creative and they created a new logo for the Olympics this year. You can see, again, everybody's keeping a safe distance there. One more of my favorite, my, you know, my favorite TV show growing up, it was Scooby-Doo. Well, I'm proud to say that Fred, he has found out who is behind the coronavirus. So if you look here, you can see, yes, there it is, the Charmin the Charmin bear, he is behind the whole coronavirus. This whole hoarding toilet paper is a very strange thing to me. But, well, this morning I am thankful for all the creative humor during this weird season. Uh, What are you thankful for? I wanted to just start off this morning and asking you to tell us your answer. Take a moment and just comment with one thing that you are thankful for this morning. There's actually a reason I want you to do this, but we're going to get back to that later in our message. But for now, just let us know one thing that you are thankful for. Comment on that. As you do that, I want to recap last week's message. If this is your first time, you can find last week's message on our website at azlifepoint.com. Just click the tab that says watch and then select previous messages. Last week, we started this two-part series titled Anxious for Nothing. And my desire for this series is to show you that we can have incredible hope in uncertain times. That peace and hope are not just possible, but they are actually promised by God. So we started off looking inwardly at how we think. Last week I shared with you how uh, you can personally have peace and hope by changing what it is that you put into your minds. By thinking on the things that are true. Honorable, just, pure, lovely, commendable, excellent, worthy of praise. We look specifically how this hope, it's not just found in filling our minds with what the world is saying, but we have to look vertically to find hope in what God is teaching us. Because when we look horizontally to the world, things seem completely out of control. But when we look vertically to a God, this world is under careful supervision. So this morning, we're going to change our posture just a little bit. Instead of looking at our thoughts, we're going to change our gaze and we're going to actually look at our actions. We're going to look at how we can help ourselves and how we can help others find the peace and the hope by changing the way that we act. And I think Paul, the author of Philippians, I think Paul knows this. So let's look at this letter again, the one we looked at last week in Philippians chapter 4. If you have a Bible there at your home, I want to encourage you to turn over to the book of Philippians. It's a small book near the end of your Bible. Uh, If you don't have a Bible, you can follow along with us on the screen. Also, if you don't have a Bible and would like one, just comment here in this message. Go ahead and send us a message uh, privately. We would be happy to get in contact with you and send you a copy of the Bible as a free gift from us here at LifePoint. For today, though, just follow along on the screen. 
Uh, so we're going to look at the book of Philippians, which I said earlier is actually a letter from a man named Paul to a church that he started in Philippi. Paul can't deliver his message in person, though, because like us right now, he was in isolation. Paul's isolation was a little bit different, though. He was isolated in a prison in Rome. Uh, he has been unjustly put there for sharing the same message of hope that I hope to share with you this morning. So let's read again a portion of Paul's letter together this morning. We're going to look at Philippians 4, verses 4 through 9, and it says this. Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I will say rejoice. Let your reasonableness be known to everyone. The Lord is at hand. Do not be anxious about anything, but in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be named to God, and the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Finally, brothers, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is just, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is commendable, if there is any excellence, if there is anything worthy of praise, think about these things. What you have learned and received and heard and seen in me, practice these things, and the God of peace will be with you. Let's pray this morning. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you so much that there within the text is this beautiful promise that we can have hope, that we can have peace. And Lord, I pray that that hope and peace that's promised would become a real to each one of us this morning. Lord, I pray that we would, as a result, be an encourager to other people by the way we live, that we might provide peace and hope to others by our actions. So Lord, grant us with that gift this morning, we pray in your name. Amen. Well, earlier I asked you to comment with one thing that you were thankful for. Uh, the reason I had you do this is because there's a lot of research that's being done around the power of gratitude. Uh, and gratitude is our emotion that relates to our ability to feel and to express thankfulness. Research shows that there are many benefits to gratitude. Here are just a few of them. Improved physical and emotional and social well-being. Greater optimism and happiness. Improved feelings of connection in times of loss or crisis. Increased self-esteem. Heightened energy levels. Strengthened heart, immune system, and decreased blood pressure. Improved emotional and academic intelligence. Expanded capacity for forgiveness. Decreased stress, anxiety, depression, and even headaches. This is the reason last week I encouraged you to go and download the seven-minute journal that we've made available on our website. It's simply a practical way to think on all the things that Paul has been teaching us, to focus on prayer and supplication and thanksgiving, to dwell on the things that are true, honorable, just, pure, lovely, commendable, excellent, and worthy of praise. The way we think can literally rewire, literally change our brain. Well, today I want to look at what's called the act as if principle. This is not positive thinking, it's positive action. By focusing on and practicing the things in life that will produce a desired outcome. For example, if you want to be happier, research says to what? Smile. All you got to do is you smile and you can actually become happier. If you want to be less anxious, then you act in such a way that you... Uh, communicate that you're less anxious. If you want to feel brave, research says to act brave. Well, so if we want to be less anxious and find peace and hope, what should we do? How do we apply the act as if principle? Well, I believe that Paul addresses this in the last verse of our passage. After telling us how we should think, he goes on to say, to combat anxiety, here's how we should act. Look at Philippians 4.9. What you have learned and received and heard and seen in me, what does he say? Practice these things and the God of peace will be with you. So not only do we need to think on the things that are true and honorable, just, pure, lovely, commendable, excellent, and worthy of praise, we need to practice 
the things we have learned, received, heard, and seen. Well, what are those things? What is Paul referring to when he says what we have learned, received, heard, and seen? What's he referring to? Well, to answer that question, I want to turn to another one of Paul's letters to the, to, to the Romans. We're going to look at Romans chapter 8. The truth is, is we could look at any of Paul's letters to find the answers to our question, but Romans 8 is a great chapter that's just packed full of truths. Romans 8 is actually often referred to as the great eight. And it's a text that I think everybody right now in isolation, we should be reading and even memorizing portions of. When it comes to being full of peace and hope, Romans 8 gives greater foundations to this fearlessness than anything this world has to offer. And this morning, we're going to look at four of them. Four things we have learned, received, and heard. Four things that Paul teaches us and encourages us to practice. The first one is this. Because of Christ, there is no condemnation. Look at verses 1 through 3 of chapter 8. There is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. For the law of the Spirit of life has set you free in Christ Jesus from the law of sin and death. For God has done what the law weakened by the flesh could not do by sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh and for sin. He condemned sin in the flesh. What Paul is saying here is that we do not stand before God guilty, but with the righteousness of Christ himself. As believers, we have received a righteousness from God that is by faith. So in Christ, our sins have been forgiven and there is no longer condemnation. Consider the testimony of this amazing woman. Uh, She says, the man I ate dinner with tonight killed my brother. The words spoken by a stylish woman of P.F. Banquet in Seattle amazed me. She told how John H. had murdered her brother during a robbery, served 18 years at Walla Walla, then settled into life on a dairy farm where she had met him in 1983. 20 years after his crime, compelled by Christ's command to forgive, Ruth Youngsman had gone to her enemy and pronounced forgiveness. Then she had taken him to her father's deathbed, prompting reconciliation. Some wouldn't call this a success story. John didn't dedicate his life to Christ, but at the PF banquet last fall, his voice cracked as he said these words, Christians are the only people I know that you can kill their son and they'll make you part of their family. I don't know the man upstairs, but he sure is hounding me. John H. was a murderer, yet he was able to live freely because of the forgiveness of a family, a family who declared to him that there was no condemnation. Carl Menninger, the famous psychiatrist, once said that if he could convince his patients in his psychiatric hospitals that their sins were forgiven, that there was no longer condemnation, that 75% of them could walk out the next day. So here's my question for us this morning. What would it be like if we acted as if? What would it be like if we walked around truly believing that we were forgiven and that in Christ there is no condemnation? What would it do for our anxiety to know that we have a God who loves us so much that he sent his only son to die so that we could have this forgiveness, so that we could have this freedom? Might we then ask ourselves this, if my heavenly father loves me this much that he would send his only son Will he not then continue to love me through this season in our lives? In addition, what would it be like? What would it do for those around us if they saw us walking around with this freedom, with this confidence that we have been free, that there's no condemnation? What would it do to ease the anxiety of friends and family to see someone with so much peace and hope because they know that they are a child of God who loves them so much that he sent his only son to die and provide peace and hope. Well, because of Christ, there's no condemnation. Secondly, in Romans 8, we see that because of Christ, we have the power of the Holy Spirit. Look at verses 9 
through 11. You, however, are not in the flesh, but in the spirit. If in fact the spirit of God dwells in you, anyone who does not have the spirit of Christ does not belong to him. But if Christ is in you, although the body is dead because of sin, the spirit is life because of righteousness. If the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, he who raised Christ from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through his spirit who dwells in you. In you. Paul here is saying the same power that rose Jesus from the dead lives in you. And if you have that kind of power living in you, if we have that kind of power living in us, then we most certainly have the strength to fight against our fears and our anxieties. Uh, In a seminary missions uh, class, Herbert Jackson told how as a new missionary, he was assigned a car that would not start without a push. So after pondering his problem, he devised a plan. He went to a school near his home, got permission to take some children out of class, and then he had them push the car off. As he made his rounds, he would either park the car or uh, on a hill or leave the engine running. He used this ingenious procedure for two years to keep the car going. Well, ill force... Um, Ill health forced the Jackson family to leave, and a new missionary came to the station. And when Jackson proudly began to explain his arrangement for getting the car started, the new man began looking under the hood. Before the explanation was complete, the new missionary interrupted, Why, Dr. Jackson, I believe the only trouble here is this loose cable. He gave the cable a twist, stepped into the car, pushed the switch, and to Jackson's astonishment, the engine roared to life. For two years, needless trouble had become routine. The power was there all the time. Only a loose connection kept Jackson from putting the power to work. So many Christians spend so much time in needless anxiety and hopelessness. They don't realize the power that they have in Christ Jesus. What would it be like if we acted as if? If we truly believed that the same power that rose Jesus from the dead lives in us. What peace, what hope would that cause in us? What would that do for the world if they saw this peace and this hope? What would it do if we boldly told them where they could find it in a relationship with Jesus? Well, because of Christ, there's no condemnation. Because of Christ, we have the power of the Holy Spirit. Thirdly, because of Christ, we are heirs with Christ. Look at verses 12 through 17. So then, brothers, we are debtors not to the flesh to live according to the flesh, For if you live according to the flesh, you will die. But if by the Spirit you put to death the deeds of the body, you will live. For all who are led by Christ of God are sons of God. For you did not receive the spirit of slavery to fall back into fear, but you have received the spirit of adoption as sons by whom we cry, Abba, Father. The Spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God. And if children, then heirs, heirs of God and fellowship heirs with Christ, provided we suffer with him in order that we may also be glorified with him. Church, we should not be surprised by the times which we live in. Because according to this verse, we share in Christ's sufferings. But the second half of that verse is equally true. We can be expectant that someday we will share in the glory of Christ. That later on we will become co-heirs or joint heirs with him. This term heirs of God emphasizes our relationship to God the Father. As his children, we have an inheritance that can never perish spoil, fade, but is kept for us in heaven. 
The Greek word translated heirs in Romans 8, 17 refers to those who have received their allotted possessions or their rights of sonship. In other words, because God has made us his children, we have full rights to receive his inheritance. We are his beneficiaries. And Christ's inheritance is what? It's the whole universe, all that is in existence. Hebrews 1, 2 says that the Son has been appointed heirs of all things. Being a co-heir with Christ means that we, as God's adopted children, will share in the inheritance someday with Jesus. What belongs to Jesus will also belong to us. Do you believe it? Are you acting like it? The musical play Annie contains a wonderful illustration of becoming an heir of God. When Annie moves from the orphanage to the Warbucks mansion, it's an incredible uh, change for her. She leaves behind a spiteful, alcoholic caretaker and enters into a relationship with a caring father. She goes from having no possessions to having a, a fortune at her disposal. The hard knock life is overcome by the brightness of a sunny tomorrow. Seen from a Christian perspective, Annie pictures what being a co-heir with Christ means, that we share in his sufferings in order that we may someday also share in his glory. What would it be like if we acted as if? Could it calm our fears and anxieties to know that what we are experiencing now is not only normal, but it is expected. And likewise, as Christians, we can expect that this hard knock life will soon be a sunny tomorrow for all who believe in Jesus. What hope we have in Jesus. So because of Christ, there's no condemnation. We have the power of the Holy Spirit. We are heirs with Christ. And lastly, we have a future glory. Romans 8, 18 says this, For I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worth comparing with the glory that is to be revealed to us. So many people today, right now, are crippled with anxiety and fear because they are scared that they could become infected with the virus and potentially die. But what if we truly believed what Paul is saying? What if we truly believe that there's no comparison between the present hard times and the coming of the good times? That the created world itself can hardly wait for what it is that's coming next. I love this story. A bank in, in, in New York had some flowers sent to a competitor who had recently moved into a new building. There was a mix-up at the flower shop, and the card that was sent with the arrangement read this, with our deepest sympathy. The florist, who was greatly embarrassed, apologized, but he was even more embarrassed when he realized that the card intended for the bank was actually attached to the floral arrangement sent to the funeral home in honor of a deceased person, and the card read, congratulations on your new location. <laughs> what would it be like, though, if we acted as if? What if we truly believed that our graduation to heaven one day would be a cause for celebration? How would that change the way we view the troubles of this world? How would it affect those around us to see someone that did not fear the virus and death, but instead was full of peace and hope? What if we paused long enough to make sure those around us knew how they too could find this same peace and this same hope? You know, this season, as I called it earlier, it's weird. And last week has uh, only exacerbated that for me and my family. Uh, my sweet daughter had been sick for days and days, and she was not improving. It was as if she got a cold, flu, and strep all at the same time. Well, the doctors tested her for strep, 
It came back negative. The doctors tested her for flu, and it came back negative. So finally, they told us it was best to assume that she had the coronavirus. All of a sudden, we went from a family wanting to help other people to a family completely isolated and being the ones in need of help. Just minutes after receiving this news, I got a call from my brother who was playing pickleball with my mom and my dad. And he told me that my mom had taken a bad fall and she had really cut up her face and had potentially broken some bones in her face. And nearby was a a doctor who took a look at her and his advice was this, avoid the ER. (laughs) Then yesterday I got a call from my real estate agent. In less than 24 hours, we were supposed to sign and close on a house that we have had for sale since last July. We were so excited to have it done. And he called to inform me that the buyers had decided that they were going to back out. Not the week that I had designed it to be. But it was a chance for me to decide, do I trust God or don't I? And I'll be honest, I have so much peace and so much hope. Why? Because I, in part, I know in Christ there's no condemnation. I know that in Christ I have the power of the Holy Spirit, that I'm an heir with Christ. And because in Christ I have a future glory. And in Christ, if I look to him, I am promised a peace and a hope that surpasses all understanding. Now, I'm sure you're wondering about my daughter. She was tested for the coronavirus and it too came back negative. My mom, she's beat up and bruised, but she's okay. Our house, it'll be back on the market this week and ready for the perfect buyer. So I chose this week to act as if. My question for you is, will you? Will you join me in acting as if, recognizing that we have hope and peace and living like it and letting others see the hope and the peace that we have in Jesus? Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for our time together. We thank you that we can come and we can be together in our homes, in our living rooms, sipping our favorite beverages in our pajamas. Lord, that we can still come together and we can worship you. And Lord, I pray that through your word, we would become more like you, that you would make us courageous, that you would make us people who are full of hope or full of peace. And Lord, that that would rub off on all of those around us. Lord, that we would not only know that we can have hope and peace, that we would act as if we have hope and peace, and in in turn, that we would find the hope and the peace that is promised to us. And Lord, we thank you that it's a promise. Thank you that we can have hope and peace right now. In Jesus' name, amen.
Thank you so much for inviting us into your homes this morning. We just wanted to take a moment to let you know if you need prayer, we're here for you. Just send us a message at prayer at azlifepoint.com. Also, if anybody you know needs help during this season, maybe it's you, a family member, or a friend, please don't hesitate to reach out. We are here to help. Lastly, if you're new, if this is your first time connecting with us, we just want to invite you to send us a message and uh, just connect with you. So take a moment and let us know how uh, you found out about LifePoint Church. So from our living room to yours, have, have a, a great, great Sunday. Sunday. Come on, that was too it. soon. Yeah, he always does that. <gasps> <laughs> have a great Sunday. <laughs> <laughs> have a great Sunday. It wasn't Sunday. Like yes, it was. Have a great Sunday.